What's up, YouTube? It's the homie Joshua, where we help others move in excellence. And today I want to talk about my first few days out of prison and in the context of mental health, right, which is going to be a series. There's a lot of angles to mental health. I just learned that October 10th is World Mental Health Day. And so uh, it's been around since 92. And so kind of in honor of that, it, it got me thinking and other people have been asking if I would talk about mental health stuff. So here it is. Um, I, I guess actually it backs up to, to when I got set up for courtesy pro is what they called it. So for those who don't already know, I was validated as a Nuestra Raza prison gang member and I was in the Pelican Bay Sioux. And so when it came time for me to be released about three days ahead of time, I was transferred to San Quentin. Right. And that's because you could not parole directly from the shoe to the streets. You had to be taken to uh, most likely the reception center closest to the area that you were paroling to. And then your parole officer actually had to come and pick you up. And that's because paroling from the shoe, you have to check in with parole within, I believe it's 24 hours. And most of the shoe programs are pretty far from where the people who are in them actually have family and live. Pelican Bay is extremely quiet. And, and I'm gonna do a video on, on my time up there, but it is very, very quiet. And so in very small areas, right? San Quentin is not. San Quentin is loud as loud can be. And I was in Adzik overflow because the Northerners and Blacks had gotten into it. And I was miserable for those three days because it was so loud. I had no property. I was given one Sudoku puzzle and, um, you know, you can only solve that so many times and I was creating my own puzzles. So there's a lot of stress and anxiety, right? Already just being in San Quentin, coming from such a quiet environment for years to now essentially like a zoo. And, and it made me reflect back. I did a, a video on, on when I first went to San Quentin in 1996, but it made me reflect back on uh, how much the noise and everything, I don't want to say impressed me, but it was my introduction to prison. And, and then how at the end of my time, almost 10 years later, um, I had a very different perspective. And so anyways, I parole, my parole officer comes and picks me up and I put on pants for the first time, like jeans for the first time in years. I put on a belt for the first time in years. I didn't know what size clothes I wore. My family sent me some dress outs and I just had to guess. I'd been in a jumpsuit or just my boxers for a very long time. And so putting on those clothes felt foreign, felt weird. Um, putting on my shoes and, and lacing them up and putting on a shirt and I'd never seen these clothes before. And so it was just a very intense experience, something as simple as getting dressed. Plus the anxiety of, man, so far it looks like I'm gonna walk out of here, right? And then my parole officer comes to get me and I sit in the front seat of the car. I had not sat in the front seat of a car since before I was in prison at, at 19 years old. I wasn't handcuffed. I had never gotten into a vehicle without being handcuffed and shackled uh, since I was 19 years old. At this point, I'm almost 30 uh, at the time that I parole. So every little thing is new. Um, and I drive off the yard of San Quentin passenger in my parole officer's car, the same way that I pulled in on that bus uh, many, many years later. And I kind of reflected on it, but I didn't necessarily have time to reflect on it because everything around me was so new. And, and I don't know if you guys have ever had a TV where the color contrast is messed up and like the greens are really green and the reds are really red and, and, and just the colors are, are unusually rich, right? That's what the world looked like to me. That's what everything looked like to me. And I drove over the Richmond San Rafael Bridge. Um, it, it just, everything was new, right? I, I'd been over that bridge a bunch of times before, but I was going home. I was going to a house that I'd never seen before. Um, my mom had moved into a, to a new place. She moved several times while I was incarcerated. Uh, and I didn't know this place that, that I was going to. She was married now. She wasn't married before I went to prison. I had met the guy that were dating, but they got married shortly after I went to the joint. And, and I just didn't know what I was walking into. And I knew I was walking into welcoming arms, but 
when I first got to the house, my parole officer decided to let me off at the house. My house was um, just a few blocks away from the parole office and it was a Friday. And so, and he had missed my normal pickup time, which is kind of an unrelated story. And so he says, look, man, I'm just gonna drop you off at home. And then, you know, you gotta get down here to, to take care of the paperwork so I could take pictures and that kind of stuff, right? Uh, but you only live here right around the corner. And so I was thankful for that, but I was nervous because I didn't have that buffer time of sitting in a parole office, right? It was just from prison to the car to getting out of the car in, in front of this house. And I stayed outside on the grass. I didn't even want to walk inside, right? And, and um, you know, my people came out, my family came out and, uh, you know, somebody gave me a cell phone and it was those old Metro phones, uh, like the real small ones, right? And so she's like, here, bro, I got you a phone. And I was like, this is crazy, right? And to text, you had to press the different, you know, numbers so many times to get the letter. I had no concept of texting. I'd had a cell phone for a while before I went to prison, but it was the big brick Motorola ones that cost a fortune just to get a phone call or answer a phone call. And so it, it you know, even when I was talking on it, I started getting phone calls. And I got to talk to my dad who, who was in county jail at the time, but on a, on a work release. I didn't even know he was in jail. Um, and, and then I found out my step was going to jail once he got out. I, I, all this was new to me, right? I never seen him in the time that I was in prison. And so uh, I'm talking on the phone and I'm holding it up here to here. And then I'm talking like this, right? And it's like that commercial that came out with a little while after, which was like, hey, can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? That was me, right? And finally, my sister, she grabs my arm and holds it. And she's like, bro, it works just like this. Like, you ain't got to keep moving it. And I was like, wow, really? Like, you can hear me? And so had that conversation and I was just standing in the grass. I remember there was a tree in the front yard and I reached out and touched it like, like I was an alien, bro. Like, like I'd never seen a tree before. Mind you, they don't have trees on a yard in prison. Um, and they certainly don't have any living object in, in Pelican Bay, except every once in a while, a weed will grow up in the drain. And, and that's like a special occasion, right? So, uh, and it never lasts long. So anyways, just touching a tree and a tree bark, even what I touched felt, um, you know, like I was very sensitive to that, you know, all, all the texture, like I really felt that. Um, and, and it was amazing and scary and foreign all at the same time. And so eventually I wind up going inside the house and I have my own room and there's clothes there that people had collected for me over the years and thought that I might like, uh, but there's a range of, of years, right? I was gone for a fairly long time. And so I started looking through the clothes and, and essentially kind of put on a bit of a fashion show for my sister and I'm putting stuff on and, hey, does this look okay? This doesn't quite fit right. You know, this does fit. Um, you know, who the hell wears this, right? Um, I had some corduroys, I thought they were sharp. I learned shortly thereafter that they weren't considered sharp anymore, but, but I still rocked them for a while. Um, and, and so I tried on every outfit, right? I didn't know what to do. It, the idea of that level of freedom had not sunk in. And, and once I went into that room, I didn't really want to leave, right? And, and so I tried on all these clothes and I actually stayed up all night that night. I didn't go to sleep. I felt like I was living in a dream, you know? And, and I was scared if I shut my eyes that I was gonna wake up sitting on a bunk. And that was scary to me. Um, and, it, and it took me a while to come to appreciate what that physical freedom felt like. Um, my family had asked, hey, what do you want? You know, what do you want for your first meal? I don't know something good, I guess, right? Like I'm used to prison food. I, I couldn't think of a meal that was not prison food. Um, I, I just had no concept of that stuff anymore. And not that I hit a lot of restaurants when I was a kid either, but, but I had no idea what I wanted. And, and that brings me to an important point, man. The range of choices was overwhelming. 
And I think that's true for a lot of people that get out of jail and get out of prison. We're not used to so many options. Uh, we live in an environment that's very structured, right? That, that's very limited, where we learn to operate within these narrow confines of what's available. We also learn routine, right? Um, you know, every Saturday, you know, evening, there's going to be some type of something similar to Mexican food, right? Every Sunday morning, there's going to be eggs and some sausage and, and that sort of thing. You can put those together. You can make a really great tamale and watch it during football. Like, it's, you come to know the schedule, know the routine. If, man, if we were 10 minutes late, like when I was in EdSec, uh, they used to play with the times that they bring the food. And they'd bring the cart and they'd leave it in the day room, but they'd be like 10 minutes late starting to pass it out. I would have an anxiety attack. I would feel like I was starving, like I wasn't going to eat that day and I would get pissed. And if I wasn't a part of the group segment that I was a part of, I, I probably would have flashed and, and snapped. But that behavior was unacceptable to, to Northerners. And so I didn't. But I was all worked up. My dinner's supposed to be here at this time. It's right there. Give me the dinner. Like very routine driven. And you come out to the streets, man, there's no routine. You, you do what you want, but you don't even know what you want to do. And so that produces a tension and an anxiety. So I wind up, uh, I wind up going to Subway. And, and I think I've told this story before, but it's very indicative of the mental health challenges of folks coming home, right? I go to Subway and I'm with my mom. And, and my sister and so they they're ordering right we're in line I'm incredibly pale from from getting out of the soup like I look like powder or Casper or whatever like I'm incredibly pale my tattoos look like they're drawn on with sharpies right um because I hadn't seen the sun in years and years and years and so I already feel like I look out of place I'm dressed in these clothes that are very unfamiliar and I'm self-conscious about what people are thinking of me. I feel like I have, you know, convict or, or prison gang member or whatever, just blasted on my forehead in a neon sign. And so I'm waiting in line and I'm getting kind of worked up because uh, it seems like there's a lot going on when you order a sandwich and, and I'm not used to that. So it comes down to my time and there's this little acne face kid, right? Who's, who's working behind the counter, probably a high schooler. He goes, hey, man, uh, what can I get for you? And I said, a ham sandwich, right? Because in prison, ham meat for sandwiches was, was probably the most similar to what it says it is than, than anything else. So I said, let me get a ham sandwich. He goes, what kind of bread do you want? I saw my mistake. I don't know what kind of bread you have. Be careful asking questions you don't know the answer to. Oh, we have this, well, blah, blah, blah. And he runs through a list of like 12 breads. I never even heard of that stuff. I didn't know there was 12 kind of breads in the world. And so I'm, brown bread, you got brown bread? He goes, wheat. I go, yeah, wheat. Yeah, sir. What do you, what do you want on your ham sandwich? Ham? Okay, you want some cheese? Sir, what kind of cheese? What do you got? The fucking 10 kinds of cheese. I, I, don't, I don't know, so I'm, I'm getting overwhelmed. I'm panicking, right? And I'm like, I have mustard, you know, mayonnaise, okay, mustard, what kind of mustard? I'm like, Jesus Christ, you know? So the, the thing that broke it, you know, the straw that broke the camel's back, so to speak, because at this point, man, I'm sweating, right? I'm sweating, I feel very hot and flushed. I feel like everybody in Subway is staring at me um, and I don't even want to look around right? Because I just know. I know all eyes are on me. And I'm like, dude, I can't. This is too much. And he says, would you like oil on your sandwich? And I lost it, bro. I, I, I lost it, right? And so I look across the counter at him and I tell him, listen here, you little motherfucker. Have you ever made a ham sandwich before? And he goes, yeah, yeah. And he's getting kind of scared. I said, make my shit like the last ham sandwich you made. Let me get the fuck out of here, bro. You trying to embarrass me out here? Huh? You trying to clown me? Fuck you. And he just said, well, here you go. Right? And I walk out 
uh, with the sandwich and I throw it in the garbage. I can't eat it. And I start to tear up, man, in, in this fucking parking lot of this shopping center where the subway is. And I said out loud, I said, man, I don't belong here. Fuck I'm doing out here. I've been home less than 48 hours, right? Man, I can't even order a fucking sandwich. Nobody else in there had a problem ordering a sandwich. It's a sandwich. Like I went to a sandwich place to order a sandwich. Nobody else had, everybody else knew what they were doing. Now I'm punking this poor kid who's just trying to give me, you know, good community, uh, good customer service. I could wind up going back to prison for that. You know, he gets scared and called the cops, bro. That's a wrap. I'm gone. You know what I mean? I'm like, but maybe I should. I don't belong out here. This is not right for me. And it's not because I wanted to go back to prison. It's not because I loved being in prison. It's because I was comfortable in prison. I was comfortable with the routine. I knew who I was in there and, and I knew how to operate. And suddenly I'm like on some island in the middle of nowhere where I'm lucky I even somewhat speak the language of the people around me. Um, and I was embarrassed, man. I was fucking embarrassed. And thankfully, and I think there's a lot of people that feel that way. Maybe the situation is different. They don't go to subway or, or, or whatever, but it's just overwhelming, right? And, and, and being incarcerated has a long-term effect on your psyche. And especially being in solitary confinement, um, studies have shown that within 72 hours of solitary confinement and sensory deprivation, your brain starts rewiring itself to be able to manage the environment. So your brain is permanently changing day by fucking day when you sit in a shoe and you got dudes that spend decades up there, right? Um, I didn't. I spent like half my time in, in the shoe, right? Um, there's people that have done, you know, five times what I did, six times what I did. Can only imagine, you know, some of those guys have been able to go home. So anyway, the thing that saved me that not everybody has. And I recognize the privilege in this, right? People talk about privilege all the time. And, and, and there are some ways that, that being formally incarcerated is a privilege. Not many, right? But, but increasingly, there are some. I was privileged because I had family and I had relatives who reminded me of the person that I said I wanted to be before I got out of prison, right? So they didn't let me fall deeper into that trap. They interrupted my thought process, right? Not right in that moment. In that moment, they gave me a hug. and said, bro, it's gonna be all right. Sorry for bringing you here, right? That's what they did in the moment. They didn't lecture me. They didn't try to, you know, school me or, or, or whatever. They didn't judge me. They didn't tell me, yeah, bro, you are fucking crazy. Um, they just loved me. You know, they, they, they gave me a hug and they got me out of there. And, uh, and I appreciate that. But down the line, they consistently, I had a few people in my life who consistently, when I would get worked up, when I would get the urge to go engage in behaviors that I shouldn't be, when I wanted to be like Linus and just go back and grab my crusty little blanket and, and, and do it moving. They reminded me that I don't want that. I may want that in this moment because I'm feeling some type of way. But before I was in this moment, when I was in that moment that I'm talking about going back to, I was determined not to stay there, right? And, and this is just part of the process. I'm thankful for that. Not everybody has that, you know? And, and too many people look and somebody catches a case right away after they get out and Oh, you must like prison. You must like being in there. You this, you that, man. For some, I suppose that's true. For others, it's a sign of defeat. We feel defeated by the expectations and the norms of society where we don't feel defeated in prison, right? And, and that's insecurity. That's a mental health issue, right? A lot of times we don't like to talk about mental health stuff or we don't like to put it in that language because, oh, then you're a J-cat or you're crazy or you need to be on psych meds or whatever. Nah, if, if you come out of prison and you don't have mental health challenges, I question 
where and how you did your time, right? Um, because that's not my experience. And frankly, that's not the experience of anybody else that I've ever met that has been to prison. It don't matter your group segment. It don't matter how long necessarily. If you were in there and, and, and you were rocking with your people, especially, you're a little fucked up in the head, right? And that's okay. I mean, it's not fair. Would, would prefer that it wasn't that way, of course. But it's not abnormal. We're abnormal to society, but we're not abnormal based on our experience because many people in society didn't live what we lived, didn't see what we saw, didn't have to process what we had to process. So of course they don't think like us. They're not supposed to. They've never been like us. And, and so we got to dispel this, this notion and, and, and separate this idea that we're abnormal and we're weird and everybody else is normal. Nah, that's not the case, you know? Um, it's, we are normal based on our lived experience. And now that we're living a different experience, we need to do what we can to adapt to that. And, and not to be like other people, to be ourselves, but to be free to be yourself in this environment. Um, and that is a process, man. I've been out 16 years this December and I ain't done by far, right? So uh, it's almost 30 minutes, man. I don't really like to make these videos too long, but I'm going to tell you one other situation. So I wind up, you know, a few days later, I wind up going to the mall and I don't go very far, right? I park in the parking lot. I can still remember walking through the parking lot and, and, you know, there was like this little bridge kind of thing over the the lower section and these big doors. And I was like, wow, like I, it was ridiculous, but I, like I was walking into some fancy building or some castle or something, right? And all these people just moving around, not tripping off anything around them. I'm hyper alert. So I can tell that they are not hyper alert and that's making me nervous. Uh, I'm used to being in an environment where Yes, I'm watching my back and I'm watching out for other people, but others are doing so as well. Maybe not a lot of people, but some. And now I'm like, I'm the only person watching. I got to catch everything. And I would notice everything. Everybody that had a tattoo, everybody that, you know, with the way that they were dressed, the way that they carried themselves. And so I walk in the double doors and I don't go far. And I find this little like kind of niche, you know, niche in between these, these two shops. And so I'm kind of in a cubby almost, right? And I'm just posted and I'm watching. And in large part, what I'm watching is the dudes walking around. Of course, I noticed the women. I hadn't seen women in a long time, right? Um, but I was looking towards the dudes because I was trying to see how to dress. Like, who looks like they're a relatively normal guy um, you know, they, they're, they're walking with a girl. They look to be around my age. Uh, you know, they're not acting a fool. And, and what are they wearing? Because I had this intense desire to not stick out. And, and so I thought, man, if I can dress like quote unquote normal people, then I won't stick out, right? And, and maybe I could live a normal life. That's just not normal, right? Um, that's not what most people do. And it didn't help that this is, you know, uh, the end of 2005, like Christmas season, right before they killed uh, Tukey Williams and Quinn. And, uh, and so I'm, you know, people are wearing skinny jeans and people are wearing pastel, you know, polo shirts and, and it was, I was like, there's I was only so far I can go, right? There's, there's limits, you know what I mean? Um, but I didn't want to walk around in size 40 dickies and, and you know, big t-shirts, right? Not as big as what some of these youngsters were wearing, like five X's, you can't even see their feet. But, but we wore oversized clothes when I was a kid. Um, but I wore oversized clothes up until the day I, I went to jail and some oversized, oversized clothes on the main line. But but I didn't want to dress like a 19 year old gang member, right? Because I wasn't. And so 
but I didn't know what the what how to fill that in, right? And and so I'm gonna leave it at that so that this video isn't too long. Again, there's gonna be multiple uh, episodes talking about mental health. Uh, subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. Turn on notifications so that you'll know when those get posted. I wanna do at least one mental health video every week, right? I don't know exactly what day, but every week I wanna do at least one. And sometimes we'll have other people on here and have a conversation and, and I'll wind up doing some lives around it, man, so that we can vibe with each other. Um, but in the meantime, man, help others move in excellence. That's what homies do. And that's what this channel is about. That's the agenda that we push, right? Is helping others move in excellence. Take care, you guys. Be blessed.